Glad you're here. Man, it's great to be able to get together. I'm going to just share with you something. This is kind of a new start because uh, I finished up Second Peter last week with the whole point of, uh, and finally, uh, and, and that being really about the fact that there's a finally. Uh, you know, the fact that everything we see, you know, God, by God's own design, uh, there's an end. And, and whether it's, you know, the acknowledgement of a personal end, or just the, the recognition that that God in in his uh, working out this progress of redemption for all of mankind, uh, there is the uh, um, revelation, not the book, but just revelation throughout Scripture that th- there's a day. There's a day coming, the day of the Lord, day of judgment, all those kind of things. And so we finished up Second Peter last week. I like Second. I like Peter. I've told you all that. I like Peter. Uh, but uh, what the realization of Peter is, is that uh, Peter admits in First Peter when he says the end of all things is near. And then in Second Peter, he says, my time is coming to a close because Jesus already told me about it. And so he's kind of sharing his sort of last uh, comments uh, with the body of Christ in that first century, somewhere in the mid fifties, probably is when Peter Peter passed. And so we're starting a new thing this morning. Walking together four. Y'all don't get uh, one through three, okay? Just so you know, <laughs> this, this is the number four conversation. Uh, one of the things that we've been working on now for um, over a year and a half is is simply uh, sort of you know the next phase of of how God just leads us and walks with us and talks with us. How many of you, when you were children, enjoyed playing with dandelions in seed form? All right. What does it look like? Puff ball. Exactly. It's a puff ball. Now, uh, some of you were probably really nice in the fact that, that all you ever did with that puff ball was pick it up and <sighs> ruin your neighbor's yard. Right, you you cast those seeds into your neighbor's yard, and 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 then it comes up in the neighbor's yard, and 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 that sort of. You know, when I was a kid, we didn't plant sod. Did y'all know that? You know, it was just grass. Whatever came up, I had to cut it. Right. We played a game with the puff ball. I revealed this to John and Nick this morning, and they couldn't believe I was this mean. But my mama knows, so. Um, so here you go. You take the end, the little stem end of the little puffball thing while you're holding and said, you know, this is going to tell me. It's going to reveal something. So you take the stem in and hide it somewhere. And I'd turn around with the puffball. I'd let them hide it. I'd turn around and I'd go, okay, and I'd move it over them like it's going to reveal where the stem is. Is it in your pocket? No, it's not in your pocket. Is it in this pocket? No. Is it in this hand? No. Is it in your mouth? And when they open the mouth, you stick the puffball in it. <laughs> See, y'all are all amazed that that's the kind of kid I was, aren't you? Yeah. See. <laughs> no, you're not amazed. All right. So, one of the the, the things that that we really um, have to come to grips with in our humanity. Now, this is going to sound really philosophical, but it's not. It's to come to grips with where it all starts. I mean, I know where I started. You know, I know where mom and dad and, and, and our family sort of started. But when you start looking into what it is that God says about starting, uh, it's important for us to kind of come to those grips to understand that God started it God started it all God started you so in Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 4 and 5 we know Jeremiah they call Jeremiah the weeping prophet right Um, I I preached through several points of Jeremiah one year and just simply referred to him as uh, as the whining prophet because when you read Jeremiah you see he's just just beset 
by the conditions and circumstances of his life and woe is me and and I got thrown in a cistern of mud up to my neck and and oh how I'm persecuted and oh and he does and I'm just I mean I'm not finding fault with Jeremiah I'm just telling you that's the message of Jeremiah and and why did he persist in it well here you go verses four and five this is what it says now the word of the Lord came to me saying all right so what Jeremiah is writing for us and sharing with us is that uh, God spoke God said to me before I formed you in the womb I knew you And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nation. So guess why why Jeremiah persisted in in his, his task. Today we would call it his ministry. Maybe we would call it a vision. Maybe we would call it his his calling, his life, uh, you know, whatever. Whatever you would call it. Why did he persist? Because uh, his statement in the very first chapter of the book of Jeremiah is, is that God told me very early on who I was. Before I formed you in your mama's womb, I knew you. Do you realize God knew you before you ever took a first breath? God already knew you. God already knew everything about you because God's not bound by time. God sees your whole life at once. God knows you. And and, and so it's interesting to me that somehow we think in our, uh, our victories that God's somehow surprised (laughs) or in our failures that God didn't know it ahead of time. Now, I'm not giving any of us an excuse or anything, but one of the things that I've gone through in life is to to sort of uh, really seek out this question of who am I? Uh, If you ever get in any kind of devotional uh, conversation with me, right, Uh, we're going to end up on that question. I'm going to ask you, who are you? Right? And so, so these, these walking together conversations, the connect groups that we're establishing, uh, they, they, they all begin in this place of asking that question. A couple of weeks ago when we, uh, uh, was it the 29th, I guess, that I preached on who are the gathering? Understanding who are the gathering is a big deal, y'all. Y'all have set aside time to be here. Yay! We like it that you're here. But who are we, right? Are we going to take our definition from maybe uh, what, what the community says we are? Or who the community says we are? 12 years ago when I came here, actually, what's today? The 12th? Uh, 12 years ago tomorrow was the first day I was in the pulpit here. And, uh, and, and, and I, I began this little journey out from this location. And I'd walk into a place and I'd go, hey, how you doing? They go, and I'm, I'm going to start a conversation. I don't care what, you know. And so we're, we're standing there talking, and, and I said to, I'd say, yeah, I, uh, you know, I just, just got here, uh, just moved to town. Uh, I get to be the pastor up at Surf City Baptist Church, and, uh, and they go, oh. And I'd go, you know Surf City Baptist Church? He said, yeah, I used to be a member there. Or I used to go there. Or I went there when I was a kid. Or and they would come across with and, and and every statement, just about. I mean, by and large, you know, uh, we love studies. How many of y'all like reading studies? Right? Everybody's interested in quote follow the science. Uh. <laughs> I'm having to I'm having to self edit real quick. Hold on. <laughs> There's a can I tell a joke that can get all of us men in trouble. Can I do that right now? All right, so last night I, I got to MC a birthday party and I told this joke and, and it was one of those grown jokes, but there is a new study out. There's a new study out um, and, and the study it, it has found that women uh, who carry a little extra weight actually live longer than the men who mention it. 
<laughs> How about that? <laughs> I, t- I told that last night, man, and I got the groans, I'm going to tell you. But what I found out in the community was is that when you ask people about the identity of the body of Christ in this place, a lot of the, a lot of the answers uh, came with the word used to. I used to go there. I used to attend there. I used to be a member there. So my next question was, and why aren't you now? You know, because I'm the new pastor. Uh, not for me, but why are you not a part of it, right? Well, guess what? Then you get into history. And then people explain. And, and, and people start giving you sort of background information on the whys. And, and, and you can do this. It's not just Surf City Baptist or, or at this point the gathering. You run into people in this community now and say, yeah, I used to go there, right? Uh, I, I'm not questioning any of that. You know, this is what I say to everybody. You know, you got to be where God wants you to be. If God wants you at the gathering, then you better be at the gathering because you're not going to be happy anywhere else. But if God wants you out yonder on the highway at whatever church out there, then you better be out there. Because if you're supposed to be out there and you're here, you're not going to be happy here. Of course, then there are those folks who, who kind of go to all of them. Yeah, I'm here and then I'm there. Anyway, who are the gathering? Who are the gathering? Well, the gathering is a worship community. We come together to worship. That's our priority. The first gatherings connect group back there. They're meeting around that question right there. Who are the gathering? I'm just giving you the answers ahead of time, okay? All right. Jeremiah, as a young man, and many believe he was a young kid at the time that he he began sharing what God was, was, was telling him, he had a statement from the very presence of God that God said to him, I knew you before you were ever born. Can I say this to y'all this morning? God knew you before you were born. God knew who you were. God knew your name. God knew knew every detail of your being. Do you know what our job is? (laughs) To find out what God knew. This is what I like to tell people all the time. I say, who are you? And when they tell me who, who, who they are, I'll say to them, is that who God says you are? See? Is that who God says you are? So the, so the journey of, of this walking together is for us to discern uh, God's purpose, plan, will, desire, identity for us. You know, I loved, I remember when I was taking a prophet's class at, at Columbia Bible College. Uh, Jeremiah was Buck Hatches. Buck was our professor, but he was an old guy. Um, Jeremiah was his favorite prophet. He said, everybody in, everybody in all of, of uh, uh, whatever, academia will say that Isaiah is the greatest prophet. And, and, and Buck Hatch would go, Jeremiah, like that. And he'd say, ha, ah. so we'd all go. Right? Uh, because the, the, the point of Jeremiah is, is that when you live out your identity, when you live out who God created you to be, you know, don't be surprised by the fact that, you know, if you're proclaiming Christ and proclaiming God's will for your life, you're going to run into some opposition. You're going to run into some, some, some tension. Now, guess what? Uh, the tension might not be quite as, as, um, as open with you as it ought to be. You might think it's a person. Well, I'm just trying to be who God called me to be, and my family won't accept that. I'm trying to be who God, I, I, I'm trying to accomplish the things that God's set before me to accomplish, but, but my work won't let me do that. Uh, I'm trying to live out my faith in my community, but but uh, my my neighborhood won't let me do that. I'm trying to be a follower of Jesus, but the world has come against me. Surprised by that? I'm not. 
I'm not surprised by it at all. Because the world, the system of this world, you see, when when in Scripture you hear that, for God so loved the world, he's not just talking about those who have surrendered to and received salvation and following him. God loves everybody in the world, but not everybody in the world loves God. And so the people in the world who don't love God generally have a problem with people who do. Okay? So when you face opposition, guess what? God knew. God, God's the one who, who, who called you out. Personally called you out. I love it. I love it when, when I look back to when I was eight years old and, and, and God, through my mom's voice and my mom flipping through the Roman road, uh, laid out the gospel before me and she said to me, God has offered this to you. God has offered you salvation. God has given you Jesus. If you had been the only person alive on, on earth, Jesus would have died just for you. I remember my mom telling me those words. And I was like, Ooh, right? God called me out. If you're a believer in Christ and received that redemption in your life, God called you out. There was a day, there was a time, there was a place where God said, said he, he, you know, he called Scott, he called Mike, called Dennis back there. He called you by name. He said, hey, I love you so much. Here's Jesus. So any time, you get into conflict with the world or you get into conflict with folks who don't love God, your first starting point, the place you begin is that God called you, God knew you. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, God knew you, right? God knows us. He formed us. Now, I started out in the sciences. Right? I, I was going to be a doctor. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> and with the way things have worked out, I'm glad or not. Anyway, uh, doctors are really frustrated right now, just so y'all know. The ones that are personal friends of mine. <laughs> All right. Anyway, that's a totally different subject that I'm not supposed to be preaching on. But here you go. God knits it together. God puts us together. You know, I, I enjoyed studying, you know, for instance, physics and biology and anatomy. And I, I, those first two years of college, you know, people will say, well, you didn't become a doctor, so that was a waste. No! I learned some things those first two years of college. The third year of college, all right, so the first two years I majored in pharmacy. The third year I majored in psychology. Yeah. Right? That third year, I remember my science, my, my psychology professor, uh, my advisor, uh, and I mentioned him a couple weeks ago, Dr. J. H. Iglehart. I was sitting across his desk and he he was telling me about psychology and how, how the study of psychology works. And and I was already, because I'd had two years, I didn't need any more core stuff. Uh, I was taking all psychology. So I had I had developmental psychology. I had um 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 psychology disorders, whatever that was, I don't know. Uh, I had it, I had all, I, mm, up to there with psychology, and I was sitting across from Dr. Iglehart that day, and, and, and he was an ordained pastor. He had gotten his, uh, his Masters of Divinity from, from Southern Seminary, uh, or Southeastern, one or the other, and he'd gone back to get his PhD in psychology, and he became a, a, a professor of psychology, and he was trying to explain to me all this psychological stuff, and, and I I was sitting there just sort of being a good student and absorbing, and I went, it sounds to me, Dr. Iglehart, that everything you're saying about psychology ignores the main problem. And he said, what's that? I said, we're fallen. Sin has disrupted who we are. And he kind of went, you're exactly right. You see, so, so how do we see God adjust, shape, form who we are? 
is by getting back to the God who made us, who knew us, who called us. So when I ask you, who are you? And you go, I'm Angie's husband, because that's who I am. And Donnie, uh, Donnie and I are both Angie's husband. Not the same Angie, just want you to know that. Uh, I'm Eli's dad. I'm the pastor, one of the pastors, because there's a bunch of us now. I, back in, in 2009, it wasn't. Uh, but anyway, I'm one of the pastors at the gathering. I'm a friend to several folks. I'm, I'm a, you know, and I go down that list of things. And so my next question before I get to the, is that who God says you are, I say, then, 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 then when I ask you who you are and you give me a list of all the things you do. So are you simply the sum total of what you do? Man, if that's the case, there's some folks in trouble. Okay? Who does God say you are? God told Jeremiah, before I formed you in your womb, mom and dad didn't form you. I put you together. You know what that means medically? Let me just share with you. I tell people all the time, people that say, oh, well, I'm taking this medicine for this. Or this doctor's doing this surgery for that. Or, or uh, something along the lines of, um, I'm having this procedure done. And I go, you know, doctors are smart people. Um, they do good work. But I can remember in the sixth grade, I got scars, just so y'all know. Got one right here where um, I fell at school, and it opened up like that because it was on my knee, right? So I went to the doctor that day, Dr. Jones. My mom was a nurse, so she took me right back, and Dr. Jones put me up on a table and started cleaning out that wound because it had dirt and rocks in it. And I laid down. And then he sewed it up. And he told me, don't get it wet. Uh, don't bend it too much. Don't, you know, gave me some guidelines for it, which I didn't follow. And so there's a big scar there now. Something I realized, you know, doctors can knit that back together with a piece of cat gut string, right? But they can't make the cells and the tissue grow back. God does that. God made us that way so that his in charge of the cells of our bodies is what happens. God's the one who heals. You might take an antibiotic to get rid of an infection, but God's the one who heals. So all this studies going on, be careful what you're listening to because God might say something else. Okay, finally, do you trust that God knows you, that God knows who you are, that God knows your yesterdays and your tomorrows? Do you trust him? You see, I mean, think about it in the body of Christ. Do we actually trust the one who made us, the one who formed us, the one who knew us before we existed, the one who called us? See that? God knows what he's doing. I mean, you think about a young guy named Jeremiah who's going to have to go speak to a nation. And, and, and there are already religious leaders in that nation. And there are already these, quote, prophets. And I'm doing, yeah, I'm doing the air quotes, sorry. Because some of those prophets uh, were, had gotten into the habit of only telling the kings and the people what they wanted to hear. Jeremiah comes along and tells them what God's saying. Like, I don't know what he's talking about, but this is what God said. That's why they kept, you know, uh, punishing Jeremiah. But Jeremiah had a faith and a trust in who God was because before he was born, God knew him. God consecrated him. God made him and appointed him a prophet to the... Now listen to what uh, Isaiah says in chapter 44. He says, but now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you. Now, obviously we know that Isaiah is a prophet. Isaiah is known as the prophet to the king. Isaiah was a part of the royal family. He was in the lineage of the kings of Israel or Judah. And so he is speaking to the, to the royal family of Israel and, and he's delivering the message that God gave him to deliver. He says, hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you. 
Folks, what has God said to you? Okay? Now, I, I, I don't go chasing rabbits in this area. I do chase a few rabbits. But if we're going to be obedient to who God is and who he's called us to be, then we got to be paying attention to what God has said. First and foremost, from his word, by his spirit, you know, as the body. Uh, Isaiah is communicating with the nation, and he's communicating with the kings, and he says, uh, Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, which means upright man, whom I have chosen. Listen to this. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call on the name of Jacob and another will write on his hand, the Lord's, and name himself by the name of Israel. Now, God is at work through his people all throughout the Old Testament. God raised him up, you know, from Abraham, from Abraham's son, from son to son to, to tribe to, to people in Egypt and coming out of Egypt to the nation, to the land, to the name. God would work. Why? Because there is a covenant in Genesis 12 that says, out of you I will bless the whole world. Right? And so, so God's people in this place need to be listening to what it is God has said to them. He says, fear not. Uh, and, and Isaiah is writing on, on both ends of the Babylonian captivity. He's writing before the Babylonian captivity. And by God's own design and the spirit at work in his life, he writes post-captivity. And he says, yes, you're going through a struggle. You're going through a desert land. You're going through the tribulations and trials that the world has imposed upon you. But fear not. Folks. We have a world in fear right now. Why? Why? I'm just going to suggest that it's because of the people or the sources that they're listening to. I said a year and a half ago, God has not given us a spirit of fear. He has given us a spirit of power of love and of a sound mind. Can I just tell you? There are people in our culture that feel powerless. Right? There are people in our culture that are so at each other that, that, that love doesn't even enter the picture. Right? Right? And I'm going to say this, and it sounds like I never took psychology classes, but I did. Folks in our culture are going crazy over all the wrong things. Okay? God has given us a spirit of power, love, a sound mind. Who are you? Who are you? What, what distresses you? You know, you're going to leave here in a few moments. Right now, I've got your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, in a few minutes, you're going to leave here. You're going to walk out there. And, and inevitably, something's going to get your attention. Right? It, it might be time to get... You're going home to cook dinner. Yes, that, that might get your attention. Oh, I, I heard another story. You know the best way to get rid of kitchen odors? Eat out. Anyway, all right, sorry. <laughs> some <laughs> uh, uh, Phyllis Diller came up with that one those of you who are old like me uh, yeah that was a Phyllis Diller comment anyway uh, you're going to walk out of here something's going to distract you a distraction can grow into a concern 
into a distress, into a trial and a tribulation. See? Folks, my, my, in beginning these walking together messages, because we're going to go all the way through 12. We started at 4, just so you know. We're going to go through 12. God is the only one behind all of this. And I don't mean the stuff that's going on in the world. I mean the one behind who I am and who you are. And if you let the world distract you, folks, can I just go ahead and tell you that's on you? If you let the world distract you and the voices of this world distract you and the studies of this world distract you, that's because you let yourself be distracted. See? Don't get distracted by what's going on out there. God said, I knew you. I formed you. I know what I'm doing. God says, don't fear, upright man, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry pond, dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Can I just go ahead and tease this out just a little bit? In Christ, you are these descendants. God has a promise for us. God knows you. God purposed and planned you. And before you can answer the question of who am I, it's very important to consider who God says you are and live that. Okay? There's no fear in that. There's no conflict in that. You see? Pray with me. God, thank you First, God, I just have to thank you for who you are. You are God. You are almighty. You are creator. You are provider. God, I thank you that, that before, I, before I knew anything, you knew me. God, before I knew you, you knew me. And you called me. Even as a mischievous kid, God, you called me out. And as much as I attempted to avoid the who you called me to be, God, you persisted. You loved me. You took care of me. You walked with me. You held me up. God, you poured your spirit into me over and over and over again. God, thank you. Thank you for giving me not, not simply purpose. God, thank you for giving me not simply victory, but God, thank you for making me alive. God, help us to be messengers of life. God, you loved us so much that Jesus, God, you, you came. Jesus died on the cross that we might have life. And yet, God, there's so much conversation about death. And like that gentleman said yesterday, death in this life is but a comma, not a period. Because, God, you have planned for us beyond this. And, God, you knew it all those years ago, all the way back before the foundations of the earth. So, God, this morning, I want to thank you for this 810 gathering. And I thank you for their hearts. And I thank you, God, for their faith and the testimony that, that each bear. But, God, if there's someone in this room this morning who at the least is challenged by what's going on in the world. At the most. Just defeated. 
then God, I pray that we would turn to you to find victory, to find life, to find love, to find purpose in who we are, in who you are. God, thank you. Thank you for today. God, I just pray that as we sing that we would respond to you. There are those that, that are struggling. God, draw them to your presence. There may be people here that don't know Jesus. God, we want to we wanna introduce them. God, help us to be your people today. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.